Hey, Bayside, thank you so much for the opportunity to preach to you the good news. Happy Thanksgiving to you and to your families. I hope you had a good time taking out that turkey in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to know God is a God of forgiveness. So whatever you did with that turkey and stuffing and that ham, God is a God of forgiveness that gives us brand new starts. But seriously, we're so thankful for this spirit of Thanksgiving that is alive and well here at Bayside Church to Pastor Ray and all the team. Thank you so much for having me. And in so far that it is Thanksgiving weekend, what I thought that we should lift up is the thing that we ought to be most thankful for, which is the grace of Jesus Christ uh, that takes whatever is broken in your life and brings wholeness to your story when you put your trust and your faith in Jesus. And to lift up that idea, I want to turn our attention to Jeremiah uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Hear now, Bayside, the word of the Lord. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, I've read from the greatest book ever written, and I bear witness this day that all of its words are true. Amen? Amen. Then out of the ashes, something beautiful emerged in its place. Then out of the ashes, something beautiful emerged in its place. Uh, on the 4th of August, 2020, uh, there in the city of Beirut, Lebanon, a massive explosion occurred. And historians are now agreed that what was a vast underground storage of ammonium nitrate to the tune of five and a half million pounds uh, suddenly exploded. It, it rocked the city of uh, Beirut and, of course, rocked this surrounding world that was already reeling from the COVID-19 pandemic to its absolute and central core. And as we watch video after video of the ensuing carnage, and we notice now that we are now lamenting there in Beirut, Lebanon, the loss of some 204 lives, some 6,500 in injuries, and some 300,000 families who were left without their homes. And now the Beirut explosion is now considered one of the most powerful non-nuclear explosions in all of human history. But then out of the ashes, something beautiful emerged in its place. Everybody jumped in to help. France and other European nations, uh, other Middle Eastern nations, the Red Cross and other rescue organizations, the UN and other political organizations. Everyone jumped in to help. And finally, of course, uh, there was a lady by the name of Hayat Nazir. Uh, whereas other relief organizations tried to come in and remedy the ills of Beirut's past, it was Hayat Nazir who came in hopes of bringing a spark for their eventual future. It was her idea to come and erect something beautiful amidst all the ashes, a symbol of hope to remind the people of Beirut uh, that their days ahead were still able to be better than the days that were behind them. And her idea was to erect some beautiful statuette that would symbolize hope for their future, even amidst the ashes that they found themselves in. Uh, she scavenges the grounds there, picking up uh, shards of metal and broken glass and things that have been thrown away. She goes from door to door asking neighbors for contributions of their broken things to make her statuette. She does this time and time and time again. And now, whereas before there was this broken wasteland full of ashes, there was this beautiful figure, this figurine of hope now in its place. It was the idea that even out of ashes, something beautiful can emerge. And I hope you're hearing where I'm going, Bayside. Uh, at the end of the day, an artist collected a bunch of broken things and she made them whole again. I hope, Bayside, that this story sounds familiar because beneath the covers, isn't this story just another reflection of the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
For the gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that God has been scavenging humanity and picking up broken things. And through faith in Jesus Christ, he makes broken things whole again. And as we come to Jeremiah chapter 18, that is essentially the big idea. We are in the midst of brokenness and sinfulness and a wasteland and ashes. Uh, But God here sends Jeremiah down to the potter's house to show that even as the potter is working on broken pieces of clay, there's another sculptor by the name of Jehovah God who's willing to take broken clay and take it into his hands and make it into something new in its place. For the next few moments, I just want to walk through this very familiar passage. In so doing, I want to lift up these three big ideas. Here we go, table of contents for our time together. Jeremiah chapter 18 is going to teach us that there is brokenness here. Secondly, but that nothing is too broken for God. And then thirdly and finally, our response to God's grace is to give our brokenness to God. I like to tag this text from broken to whole. Let's pray. God, I thank you, Father, for this moment. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that we use this moment to ignite hope in the hearts of your people to remind them that no matter what brokenness that they're dealing with today, God, they can simply put their brokenness into the hands of you, God, the great potter, and know, Lord God, that you can make us whole again. Father, would you do work that only you can through the gospel in this hour? For we pray it in Jesus' name. Every heart said with me, amen. Basically, when you come to Jeremiah chapter 18, the big idea here is this. There is brokenness here. There is brokenness here. That is the big idea in Jeremiah chapter 18. Uh, This passage captures what one scholar said was what was a personal experience for Jeremiah uh, grows into a parable and ultimately becomes prophecy. It is this personal experience for Jeremiah that grows into a parable and ultimately becomes uh, prophecy. Uh, God sends the prophet Jeremiah down to the potter's house to see the potter who is busy working at his wheel, making this broken clay into something beautiful. And in so doing, he lifts up this powerful metaphor that our lives, our situations, our stories are like broken clay in God's hands. But Jeremiah notices how even though the clay is broken, the potter does not uh, disregard, if you will, the clay, but rather he takes the brokenness of the clay and he weaves it and molds it together to make something beautiful out of the brokenness. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, when we are broken, does not throw us away, but rather he embraces us with our brokenness and gently and graciously reworks us into something new. That is the very gospel that is being celebrated here. But I want you to understand this. You can't appreciate uh, what's going on uh, in our house until you understand what is going on in God's house in this passage. So go with me in the classroom for a few minutes. I promise we are going to church. Jeremiah is known in his day as the weeping prophet because here as he's prophesying to the nation of Israel, we are somewhere between, between sin and judgment. We are somewhere between cause and consequence. Pretty soon because of their wickedness and debauchery, God is going to allow the the evil oppression of Babylon to take the people of Israel away into captivity for 70 years. There's a lot of brokenness that that is going on in this passage. And so the question I've got to beg of Jeremiah chapter 18 is this. Stay with me in the classroom for a few more minutes. I promise we're going to church. The question we've got to ask is what is the emotional backdrop of Jeremiah chapter 18? Here's the answer. There's brokenness here. There is sin here. There are mistakes here. There's debauchery here. There's there's rampant wickedness here. But at the end of the day, for those of us who are listening to this message, who have real lives with real situations in real time, the question that we got to ask at the end of the day is that at the end of the day, there's not just brokenness here in our passage. There's brokenness in us as well. Now, for Israel, it's political chaos. it's, It's wickedness. It's brokenness. But for you, your brokenness may be the the furlough that your company still has you on. There's brokenness here and there's pain here and there's confusion here and there's desperation here. Your brokenness may be what's going on with your marriage that was already tough, but now it's coupled with a pandemic. Your brokenness may be an unfavorable diagnosis that your doctor just announced to you. 
Your brokenness may be an opioid addiction or a gambling addiction or a pornography addiction. Your brokenness may be the fact that there's, there's money that's funny and there's credit that doesn't get it, that there's ups and downs and upheaval in your life, that there's family dysfunction, that there are rhythms that have been exploded because now the kids are having to go to school online and I don't get to go to my office. I have to do the Zoom. Everything is upside down. And at the end of the day, you are feeling the brokenness of this moment. And here's the thing. You don't know what you're going to do. Some of us are kind of to the end of our rope and we're thinking to ourselves, if this pandemic moment looms any farther in my life, honestly, I just don't know what I'm going to do. And I just want to be real and be honest and say me too, because there's a voice somewhere in my head that's saying, you know what, if it gets any harder, if it gets any tougher, if it gets any crazier, if it gets any wilder, if it, if it gets any more chaotic, there's a voice growing in my head that I'm going to listen to that says, just give up. Just throw in the towel. It's just, just take a year off of this old spiritual stuff and I'll come back at it after 2020. There's a voice in your head that's growing louder and louder. And I came to Bayside to tell you this, if we stop in the brokenness, brokenness will be the story. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't turn your back on the God who can take your brokenness and bring you to a place of wholeness in your life. Because if you stop now, brokenness will be the story. And I've come to tell you that this is not the end of your story. The page that you're on in your life is not the last page. The moment that you're in is not the last moment. What is happening today does not define your tomorrow. Just because you failed doesn't mean you're a failure. Just because you made a mess doesn't mean you are a mess. And just because you are broken doesn't mean that there's a burden that God cannot handle in your life. If you quit now, brokenness will be the end of the story. Milton Hershey, the great chocolatier, uh, is a wonderful businessman, but you may be interested to know that the sweet Hershey's chocolate is really the product of bitter failure. Uh, he goes into his apprenticeship to learn how to make candy. And finally, he gets all his resources, all his money, all his knowledge, and he starts a company in Philadelphia in 1976, fails miserably. That gets up all his money, all his resources, all his knowledge, and tries again in New York, fails miserably. And at the end of the day, he is now facing bankruptcy. He just wants to throw in the towel and quit. Yet some friends came to him and say, if you quit now, quitting will be your story. If you give up in the brokenness, brokenness will be your story. So he gives it a few years. He gets up all his money again, all his resources, all his knowledge, and he tries a third time. The company explodes. It becomes the biggest candy company in all of history. He's hired 1,500 people. It spreads all over Europe. And now he remains one of the most generous people in American business history because he didn't give up when the brokenness wanted him to. Brokenness, if you give up in it, That'll be your story. Don't lose hope. So Ricky, at the end of the day, what should I do? Here, I want to remind you of the songwriter's words that says, after the rain comes a rainbow. After the war, there is peace. After the night comes the morning, just hold on to the after comes. Hershey's story reminds us that if I'm in a bitter season, some way, somehow, God will follow it with the sweet season. In the name of Jesus, there is brokenness here. And why can we hold on? amidst the brokenness, because at the end of the day, what Jeremiah 18 teaches us here at this Bayside is that nothing is too broken for God. Nothing is too broken for God. Look at verse four with me. It says, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands, and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. The idea here is that nothing is too broken for God. Oh, Bayside, I hope you can get excited about this like I did, because um, Jeremiah 18 is originally written in a language called Hebrew. In the original verbal construct, I promise not to nerd out too much here, but the actual words here, if you were to translate the Hebrew woodenly, it's subjunctival in its orientation, which essentially means this. Were I to get just a wooden translation, it would say this, whenever the clay was broken. Whenever the clay was broken, the potter would rework it. The thrust is this, whenever the clay broke the potter would take the brokenness and rework it into something special. I can't hear you say amen, but somebody should have said amen right there. Whenever the clay was broken, what's the lesson? Apparently there's something about the potter here 
that embraces the truth that sometimes clay just breaks. Sometimes clay has to start over. Sometimes clay doesn't perform. Sometimes clay makes mistakes. But what I want you to see is the grace of the potter not to discard the clay, but rather to embrace the clay and rework the clay. Oh, I'm telling you if, you, if you say amen now, I'll preach much shorter, even though I can't hear it. The idea is that nothing is too broken for God. Two things I want you to see, and we'll go on to the third point. The first thing is this. God does not throw the broken thing away. The Bible says that the clay was spoiled. The Hebrew there is the idea that it was completely ruined and good for nothing, but the potter never throws it away. What's the lesson? God never throws you away. God doesn't give up on you. God doesn't give up on your dreams. God doesn't give up on his grace for you. God doesn't see your brokenness. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your mistakes and then move past you and go on to so-called bigger and better things. No, he patiently sits with you and he restores you and he loves you and he lifts you up and he moves you forward in your life. There's something about God that can just take the brokenness of our lives and use it as fuel to get us to where he wants us to go. Y'all remember Back to the Future movie? Great 80s movie, of course. It's uh, Doc Brown who's invented this DeLorean car that's a time machine. And of course, you got to get plutonium to run it. That's the, the whole adventure of the story. Marty McFly and all these things. And of course, the movie happens. The day is saved. Marty is there at the end of the story with his girlfriend. And Doc Brown appears out of nowhere from the future in the DeLorean. And he says, Marty, we got to go back to the future and save your kids. And Marty looks at Doc Brown and says, Doc, how can we do that? We don't have any plutonium. He says, it's not a problem. And then Doc Brown lifts the hood of the DeLorean and exposes what is now what was before a plutonium engine is now something that's powered by something called a Mr. Fusion device. And Doc Brown goes scrummaging through the garbage can and he gets banana peels and he puts it in the Mr. Fusion device and he gets some eggs that are shattered and, and spoiled and he puts it in the Mr. Fusion device. He even gets an old beer can and he pours it down the Mr. Fusion device and then they put it in there and they go back to the future. Apparently, there was something about the Mr. Fusion device that knew how to take something that had been thrown away but use it as fuel to get them back to their future. God told me to tell you that he is, he is heaven's Mr. Fusion device. He knows how to take the, the, the discarded, broken, fragmented pieces of your life and use it as fuel in your soul through the gospel of Jesus Christ to get you back to your future. God never throws broken things away. Secondly, I just want you to see this Bayside. He didn't throw it away. He just reworked it into something better. Look at verse four. It says he reworked it into another vessel. That word reworked is the Hebrew word sha'as. Sha'as is the idea of, of, of taking something and manufacturing something that was completely broken. And the... The word reworked there is the Hebrew word sha'as. A sha'as is the idea of manufacturing something out of otherwise totally ruined parts. And here the Bible is saying that the potter sha'as the clay. He takes something that is completely ruined and he makes it into something that is brand new. Ricky, give me some more Bible. I'm glad you asked. That word sha'as is a strong and powerful word and it's used as early as Genesis chapter 3 verse 21. Adam and Eve have sinned, they're naked, they're ashamed, they deserve death, hell, and the grave. But notice that the Bible teaches us that God didn't turn his back on Adam and Eve, but rather he turned his face towards Adam and Eve. And the Bible says he, to show the grace that was coming in Christ, he took an animal in skins and he shaast them. He covered them. He showed them grace. He showed them love and reworked them into something brand new. God told me to tell you, you, that whenever you feel like your brokenness is too great to bear, that whenever you feel like you've sinned too much, that you've messed up too much, God says that just because you failed doesn't mean you're a failure. He will shaas you and move you back to where you need to be. Instead of kicking you out, God will bring you in. Now, who am I talking to? Because at the end of the day, the, the note here is that if you still got sin, God still has salvation. If you still got that that backslidden condition, he'll make it a breakthrough. If you still feel like you're a mess, he will make you 
over. And I hear some of you saying, but Ricky, I've messed up too much. Ricky, I've, I've made too much of a mess of my life. Ricky, I've had to ask God for forgiveness time and time again for the same thing. Ricky, you don't understand. I, it was my fault that my marriage is in this condition. Ricky, you don't understand. It, it's, it's my mess that made my finances the way that they are. Ricky, you don't understand what I did. I did, I did, I did. But I've come to tell you that the text says whenever the pot would break, Ah, do, you, do you see it now? Whenever the clay was broken, whenever there was a situation, whenever you sin, God says, if there's breath in your body, nothing is too broken for God. Put it in the hands of God. Let me close on this idea. There's brokenness here. Nothing is too broken for God. But thirdly and finally, Bayside, what do we do? Here it is. You give God your brokenness. You give God your brokenness. Look at this, Bayside, on screen. Put the broken clay of your life into the hands of the potter, which is Jesus Christ. I love the analogy here. It's so simple that anyone can get it. Even if you're new to church, you can understand this. The, the idea of Jeremiah chapter 18 is that God is the potter, we are the clay. God is the potter, we are the clay. I'll say it a third time. God is the potter, we are the clay. What then? is the application for how we truly need to make this stuff real in our lives. Here it is. Put the broken clay of your life into the hands of the potter and recognize that God is the one who shapes. We are the ones who submit. God is the one who shapes. We are the ones who submit. I'm going to say it a third time, Bayside, because this is the key from moving from brokenness to wholeness is recognizing that as you take this new start, as he reworks you into something new, as he extends to you grace and forgiveness and cleansing and fuel for the future, remind yourself on this go around that God is the one who shapes and it's our role to submit to what he's doing in our lives. I've got three kids, six, four, and two. Uh, two boys and a girl. And one thing about my kids is that they love playing with Play-Doh. They love playing with their Play-Doh. They got neon green and fuchsia pink and uh, orange and all these wild zany co colors. And they, they call themselves uh, master artists because they make masterpieces. And so what's funny about today's Play-Doh generation is that they've got all these, these utensils and these, these stencils and all these sorts of things. They make everything. They make triangles. They make spheres. They make squares. They make lions, tigers, bears. You say... Oh my, they, they make spaghetti, they make meatballs, you name it, they make it. But what I've noticed is in the years of my children playing with their Play-Doh, not one time as they make their masterpieces, not one time did I ever watch my kids ask the Play-Doh what the Play-Doh wanted to be. And not one time did I see my kids making Play-Doh where the Play-Doh would push back against what my kids wanted the Play-Doh to be. The idea is that they seemed to understand that they, as master artists, knew what was best for the Play-Doh. And the Play-Doh seemed to understand that whatever was good to the master artist would ultimately be good for them. That's what verse 4 is teaching us when it says that the potter would rework it into another vessel as it seemed good for him to do. I want you to just kind of look at this in a granular way, Bayside, as the potter is reworking with the clay. Not one time does the clay talk. Not one time does the clay push back against whatever it is the potter is making it into. Not one time does the clay complain because the clay seems to understand in this passage that whatever has seemed good for the potter to do will ultimately be good for me. So when you start over this time, start over with a submissive heart that says, God, whatever you want this marriage to be. God, whatever you want this heart to be. God, whatever you want this career to be. God, whatever you want this education to do. God, whatever you want these children and these grandchildren to do. God, whatever you want this nation I love so dearly to be. God, whatever you want is what I want because whatever seems good to you, I know it'll be good to me. So I encourage you in these few moments to confess your brokenness to God 
and then give your brokenness to God, knowing that he knows how to take you from brokenness to wholeness. Bayside, until we meet again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. For we pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.